We'll begin in just a minute or so. Thank you for being with us. Beautiful. Well, welcome, welcome friends to Healing the Disconnect, our May 1st Monday lecture with Marcel Martin. My name is Lena Blunt. I am the education coordinator here at Pendle Hill, and I will be sort of emceeing our evening tonight. It's a pleasure to have you all with us. I'm going to share a couple of announcements, um, an orientation to how we do these sessions, and then we'll hear a song and we'll settle into some worship before we hear from Marcel. There will be time for questions at the end of our session. You might notice uh, that you can't chat to each other. That's a choice that we make for these lectures so that we can really be present to what uh, Marcel is saying tonight. But when we get to the question and answer session later, you can submit your questions in the chat and myself or Francisco Burgos, who's the executive director at Pendle Hill, will moderate the questions, reading them aloud for Marcel to respond to. We are live streaming tonight, so hello to our friends on YouTube as well. Really glad to join you all for our first Monday lecture. We do these lectures every first Monday, so I would like to briefly um, speak about our lecture coming up in June. The first Monday of June is June 7th. Um, from 7.30 to 9 p.m., we have just the great pleasure to welcome Wendy Cooler, who was our 2020 Cadbury Scholar, who will be uh, sharing on Better Than Good, Seven Testimonies for Quaker Caregiving. In addition to that June 1st Monday lecture, I hope that you might consider joining Marcel again later this month. Marcel will be leading a weekend workshop on going deeper together May 21st through 23rd on Zoom. You can learn more about that program with Marcel on our website, pendlehill.org. Um, and you can also learn about Wendy's uh, first Monday lecture for June, Better Than Good on our website as well. Well, that covers our announcements. Uh, I invite you to settle into some silence, listening for spirit, and I will share a song. This comes from the words of George Fox and the chant is from Paulette Meyer. Ye have no time but this present time. Ye have no time but this present time. Ye have no time but this present time. Therefore, prize your time for your soul's sake. Ye have no time but this present time. Ye have no time but this present time. Ye have no time but this present time. Therefore, prize your time for your soul's sake. Ye have no time but
at this present time. Ye have no time but this present time. Ye have no time but this present time. Therefore prize your time for your soul's sake. Good evening, friends. It's a real pleasure to be here with you tonight. It's a pleasure to see the, the faces and the names of so many people that I know and so many people that I don't know. It's really wonderful to be with you here. Thank you for coming. Um, before I start talking, I just like to invite everyone to take a, a couple moments just to be with yourself and just to pay attention to how you are at this moment as you enter into this um, evening event together. So if it's helpful to you to close your eyes, you might. I'm not asking you to change anything about yourself except just to notice what's going on with you in your mind and especially in your body at the moment. Are there any tensions or pains that you notice in your body? And if there are, without changing them at all, can you just be with them for a moment? It is my hope tonight to speak to your mind, but especially to your heart and to speak from my mind, but especially from my heart. And so as we begin, I invite you to pay attention to your own heart and maybe ask, is there anything you need to do for your heart to be receptive to this talk tonight? And see if you can listen from that place of your heart being receptive, as well as your mind. Um, when Lena and I first talked about um, this talk a few months ago, she said she liked the title I had proposed, but we couldn't use it because it was similar to the title of some other event they were holding at Pendle Hill around the same time. So she said, let's, let's take some time for worship together and see if another title comes. So we took some time for worship together and in the silence, very strongly, the title came, Healing the Disconnect. And Lena and I were both satisfied with that title. And so she ac accepted it. And um, since then I've been living with that title and I realized, wow, this title is for something a lot bigger than what I initially proposed. Um, and for me, um, one of the biggest disconnects that I notice sort of outwardly in our time is, is the disconnect between the situation of the climate crisis and the very muted way that we are collectively responding to that crisis. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm going to spend a little time, um, I'm obviously not, um, I don't have all the answers, but just looking at what are those disconnects which manifest in that and in so many other ways. Um, this is a journey. I am in process. I don't have all the answers. I have a lot of questions, but I do have a leading to share with you some of my journey about this. And I also want to say that this is something that I that none of us can discover the answer to or the way forward alone. It's something that we need each other for. We need each other with open hearts and open minds and willing souls working together and helping each other to bring our best gifts forward. Um, 
I do believe more is possible than the scientists say, but only if we do that and only if we do that together. So sort of as a brief outline, Lena, would you show the slide about some of the disconnects I'll talk about tonight? And I assume most of you know that you can decide how, well, depending upon your computer screen, how big you want these slides and how much of your screen you want to have for the um, gallery view or speaker view. Um, well, I'm gonna talk a little bit about each of these four disconnects, the disconnect from our head and our heart or from our mind and our um, other kinds of perception, the disconnect between humanity and the earth and the rest of creation, or at least our perceptions of a disconnect, our disconnect or a perception of a disconnect between humanity and God or spirit and spiritual reality, and the ways we are disconnected from one another. Of course, you could have a whole lecture or a whole weekend workshop or a whole year long course on any of these. So I'm just gonna briefly talk about each one. Um, and that's enough for the slides for now. Um, so I, I'm just gonna give you a, in, in a nutshell, something about my spiritual journey, which is that it was almost 40 years ago that I woke up to the fact that my life had a purpose and that I was on a spiritual journey and that I um, had some kind of connection to this mysterious thing that I was calling God or I'd been taught to call God in which I was still exploring what that was. Um, so it's been a long journey. I have found help along the journey from many different religious traditions and teachers, but I have found a home um, and a spiritual home in a community among Quakers for um, since 1992. Um, and since about 1996, I have been a teacher of Quaker spirituality. I just um, plunged right into it. I took a lot of courses and workshops and events at Pendle Hill, which was a, a wonderful, wonderful place to do that, um, and many other places. And I also began to plunge into the writings of early friends and, and to um, experience um, the living um, Quakerism in my um, meeting community, I was a nomad. And so I have, um, I have been a regular attender at seven different meetings in both Pennsylvania and Indiana. I've been a member of three meetings. And as I became a traveling minister, traveled in the ministry among friends, visiting Quakers in at least 20 states, retreat centers, meetings, quarterly meetings, yearly meetings, um, special events. Um, I have seen a lot of different Quakers and gotten to know Quakers from all the branches of Quakerism and unaffiliated friends and more. Um, and in 1997, I felt called to give up college teaching to do this ministry full time, which was a big leap of faith because the money I made for at least between 1996 and the time I became a Quaker studies teacher at Pendle Hill, my average income was about $8,000 a year, which meant I needed to live um, live with other with other friends. Um, so all of that has required a lot of faith and courage and especially um, for someone like me who has been shy and timid and uncertain. Um, and yet I've had these powerful uh, experiences of God, a spirit of guidance for almost 40 years now. Um, but there came a point in time, and, I, and part of my experience had to do with a, a growing awareness of energy in my body and of the kinds of moments or times when the energy would flow more strongly. And also that um, an understanding that it's like electrical wiring in a house. It can, the wiring in your body can hold a certain voltage and, and your spiritual journey helps you to develop wiring that can carry a higher voltage. Um, and I reached a point actually in uh, around 1990 where I thought I was like, really, I'd gotten it. <laughs> I was close to uh, enlightenment. This is before I, I really became involved with the Quaker community. And I had a powerful dream. I dreamed of a bundle of wires all tied together and almost every single wire was cut. And it, 
the dream was a shock to me and I, and I took it as, as an image both for myself and for, for him, my community, humanity in a larger way, that the disconnects in our wiring, in our spiritual wiring, in our physical energetic wiring was just, the damage was much greater than we had any idea. Um, and it was shortly after that, that I, um, 1992, that I um, took my first workshop at Pendle Hill and then immediately found a nearby Quaker community, Quaker meeting, and became a regular attender and then a member. Um, and realized that this, my lonely spiritual journey wasn't going to take me, wasn't going to um, be enough sufficient for the healing that I needed, that really a collective healing and becoming part of a community and these wonderful practices that Quakers have both Quakers today and Quakers from um, history. One of which is um, the one I started with, that, that, um, that way of perceiving the spirit, the moving of the spirit um, from the heart and not just from the head. Um, the heart is very sensitive. It feels pain, it feels vulnerable. And our culture teaches us um, teaches us that certain aspects of ourselves, certain perceptions that we have, certain um, truths about us are not acceptable and that we have to shut them down. And it's really painful if we don't, the, the society makes it painful. So we learned actually to cut those things out of our awareness as much as possible. And so they remain in our awareness often as just tensions or pain in our body or in our psyche. Um, and it really requires a lot of attention in order to find out what those, what those things are hiding, what parts of ourselves we have cut off in order to be acceptable in society. Um, as, I, as I learn things, I, I, um, I look for evidence that, um, or ideas about what early Quakers thought of it. And I have found lots of evidence in the writing of early friends that it was the perception of the heart. It was through the perception of the, what we call the heart or the center of the body that we, we call the heart center um, or it's many people call the heart center um, that was important. That, that it, it was a process that involved actually quieting the thinking of your brain so you could pay attention in a sensing way for instance, in one of George Fox's um, well-known letters to Lady Claypool, I think it was, he started out by saying, be still and cool in your own mind and spirit. Quiet your mind. Um, there's a beautiful passage by Francis Haugill about the gathered meetings that happened at, at the beginning of the Quaker movement. And there's a key phrase. He said, we waited in pure silence, our minds out of all things. And he doesn't give any instructions about how to get your mind out of all things, because our minds are usually pretty busy and engaged with lots of things and lots of ideas. But that was a key to, um, I believe, to the experience of entering into the gathering meeting was learning to quiet your minds. And in Pennington's famous instructions about um, worship, it's like give over your own willing, give over your own running. Give over your own desiring to know or be anything and sink down to the seed which God plants in the heart. So again, it's like, and I, I, Isaac Pennington was a great intellect. He was a brilliant man who for 20 years been looking for the true way to worship God. And he'd gone and explored all these different religions and written uh, various manifestations of the Christian religion in England at the time. And he wrote different books and tracts about it. And he really uh, didn't find what he's looking for until he came to Quakers. And only after he learned that it was the perceptions of his heart he had to pay attention to. And his mind had to sort of sit on the side, not that it was useless. And he continued to write books that are great, but that he had to lead from his heart and not from his mind. So I'm going to um, talk next about our, our disconnection from the earth and from the rest of creation. And our body is, of course, part of creation. Um, it's the closest part of creation. It's the part of creation that we, we carry with us intimately all the time. Um, and we, we 
oftentimes we forget that our body is a part of creation, that it is a part of nature, that it is a part of the natural world, that it's not separate from the natural world, it's not separate from the earth. And I would like to share with you a story of just one day when I learned something about that. Um, so I call this story the forest knows. And it happened um, at a time when I was actually, um, I'd actually been hired to become the resident Quaker studies teacher at Pendle Hill, but not for a year because it was, it was gonna be a year later that the current teachers were going to um, retire. So I had one more year of living as an adjunct or living as a, living uh, in a marginal way for 20 years at that point, in order to be faithful to my call, I'd lived without health insurance. It was only after Obamacare that I had got health insurance. Um, and I had a lot of anxieties about that because there was something growing near my shoulder um, that my doctor said needed to be biopsied. And um, I didn't have the money to pay for the biopsy or for uh, you know any serious illness if there was one. Um, so I was worried about that, but I was also worried because I felt like I was inadequate to become the Quaker studies teacher at Pendle Hill. I didn't know enough. I wasn't wise enough. I hadn't been Quaker long enough. So I was worried, worrying about lots of things at a time when some, uh, a group of women invited me to join them at a retreat. They were holding a private retreat in the Friends Wilderness Center in West Virginia. I bet some of you have been there. It's a very beautiful place. Um, I actually only knew one of the women, but I said, yes. Um, there's a, a little house in, in, in this uh, wilderness area and the director of the house cooks wonderful meals and she cooked meals for us. And then we went and set up our sleeping bags on what was called the tree house. It's just this platform up in the air um, with a roof on it. And um, you climb up these wooden steps and you set up, set up your, your, um, your little sleeping areas. Um, but it's completely open to the open to the air. And um, so we had a nice day walking in the woods and then we went to sleep that night on the, in the tree house. And I um, snuggled into my sleeping bag with an extra blanket on top or whatever. It was, it was surprisingly cold out. It was only September. It was windy out and the wind was coming through the tree house. And so um, one thing about this retreat is that one of the women I didn't know had brought this great big dog named Spencer. And I am not a dog person. My family had a beloved dog named Buster that they got after I went away to college. And I, I sort of, I got to like him, but I never was a dog person. And I was kind of annoyed that someone had brought this great big dog for this like retreat in the woods, Spencer. Um, in the middle of the night, I really needed to go to the latrine. And so I got out of my sleeping bag and Spencer woke up and watched me like walk into the woods. The latrine was actually quite a walk from the tree house. And I was, I had not, um, I had not checked my flashlight before this trip and the, the, the light beam was pretty weak. Um, when I came out of the latrine, I forgot how many turns I needed to take around the latrine to, to be in the right direction to go back to the treehouse, and I did it wrong. And I'm walking into this wood, the woods a long distance looking for the treehouse, and it just doesn't show up. And finally, I, I come to a moment when I realize I must have turned too many times around the latrine. I must be walking in the wrong directions. I'm lost in these woods. Um, and I knew that Spencer was there and Spencer was awake and that all I had to do was shout and Spencer would bark and everyone would wake up and I would be okay, find my way back. But I thought, before I do that, before I wake everybody up at one o'clock in the morning, let me see if there's a reason why I'm lost in these woods at the night, in the night. And um, so I sat down on a log and I, and I just paid attention, prayed, you know, And finally, uh, a message came to me. It was a line from a, a poem. The message was, the forest knows where you are. I thought, huh. Maybe that means I'm supposed to get to know this little place in the forest where I've landed before I rush to get out of it as fast as I can. 
So I looked around and I noticed, you know, the trees were in a certain relationship to each other. And I decided I could, I could stand to spend some time right here in the forest. And I made myself a little bed out. I gathered some leaves and put them at the base of the tree. And I actually lay down on those leaves and I looked up at the sky and between the treetops, way, way above, I, the swaying treetops, I could see the stars. And I lay there. And I thought about all the, you know, my Quaker ancestors who had actually spent a lot of time sleeping in the forest in their travels in the ministry. Um, that was just part of the journey for them. And, um, and then I thought, you know, I'm a part of this earth and I am so disconnected from it. It seems like a, you know, a wilderness to me. And yet I'm supposed, I was made to live here. I was made to be able to sleep here. I was made to be able to travel through these woods. The forest knows where I am uh, and I don't know where I am. And I just sort of relaxed in that bed of leaves and a lot of my fears just melted away. These fears I told you about, these fears about not having enough money, about not being good enough to be a Quaker citizen. It's like, I didn't actually fall asleep. I didn't never felt comfortable enough to fall asleep, but um, I relaxed enough and these fears just melted away. And when dawn came and I could see where the tree house was and I walked back and everyone was surprised because they thought that mound where my sleeping bag was, was me. And I learned something very moving, which is that from the moment and the owner of the dog Spencer or the companion of the dog Spencer said that in the middle of the night, Spencer had woken up and moved to this edge of the platform in the direction where I had been. And he had stayed on the edge of the platform, just like looking into the woods all night. And I, that was so moving to me. It's like Spencer knew where I was too. <laughs> and Spencer was looking out for me and I didn't even know that. And, and that's just a little story that illustrates um, how, you know, how disconnected we are from our home in nature, but how nature really has a place for us. We just need to find our right place in nature. Um, I, have, I have a lot more um, things that I want to say about that. And I'm, I'm trying to say a lot of things, but not to speak fast. So <laughs> um, I have had a couple of experiences in my life, important experiences where I felt like a particular tree beckoned me. It's like without words, without motions, just called to me and I came. And one time I discovered a tree was in distress. Um, another time the tree seemed to, or being with the tree seemed to help me with a, a, a problem I was having at the time. Um, I think we can develop a much greater sensitivity to nature than we have developed now. And there are some people now who do have that greater sensitivity. You know, I've heard that the, um, the gardens in Finhorn are, are magnificent because they cultivate a sensitivity to the needs of the plants and to sort of listening to what the plants have to say to them about what they need. Um, I wanna tell you briefly about a friend who's cultivated that kind of sensitivity toward what nature has to say to us. And that her name is Kathleen, Maya Kathleen Tapp. And she's written this beautiful collection of poetry that has come out of her travels to different places, listening to how nature speaks to her. And one of those places is Pendle Hill and the trees of Pendle Hill have spoken to her there. Um, her husband, Ken is a, gorgeous uh, nature photographer and together they've put together the poetry and the photographs into what they call the prayer of the world and it has different sections that there's a book coming out now that's um, containing that one section called the rainbow song and Lena if you'll put up a slide I'm just going to read a tiny snippet from the rainbow song in the prayer of the world and I don't see it on the screen um, There we go. So she speaks in the voice of nature, in the voice of um, the life of God in nature. I call to you from the voice of wind. I call to you on currents of air. I am the flow, halo, light, air, prayer of the wind. All is connected in a living, breathing web. And I am the web the living pulse of energy that flows through all creation, each pulse a prayer. 
And in the prayer of the world, nature invites us to join into that prayer, which creation is, that prayer of praise and celebration and wisdom. And it, it also points out that the problem is we have left our place in the web. We have disconnected from the web. But it invites us back into the web and into life as a prayer, as a, as a joy, as a celebration of God present in creation, of the divine life that's present in creation. Um, so how do we face this climate crisis? It's important to open our senses to nature, to find our place in nature. It's important to do inner work, and I'm going to talk more about that hoping I'm leaving myself enough time. It's also important to be involved in um, asking ourselves, how does my outer life have to be? And I know a lot of people are, are working, for instance, on um, racial justice. How, does, how do I have to act in my outer life to heal, um, heal what's wrong inside of me, what, what needs to change inside of me? So I've been also asking that question in relation to climate change. Like what in my lifestyle needs to change? Um, I've been trying to learn more about that. Um, the causes of um, climate crisis. One of, one of my friends who I met while she was a student for one term at Pendle Hill a long time ago is now a climate scientist at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland, Rachel Howell. And I watched a talk she gave recently in which she said, People don't like to be confronted with the climate crisis, um, but they, people need opportunities to explore it. And she said, one way I do this is when I talk about Pendle Hill, she said, I love to talk about Pendle Hill. I say to people, before I gave up flying, when I was at Pendle Hill, um, and then if people wanna ask more, they'll say, why did you give up flying? Well, that's a challenge to me. It's like I've been challenged when I understood how much flying contributes to climate change. Am I gonna give up flying too? And I haven't come to that point of saying, yes, I'm giving up flying, but I have come to the point of saying, I won't fly unless it's really, I feel really called it's when there's ministry involved and I've been struggling with that. So I'm glad to be struggling on that point, realizing there's lots of things I do in my life that I need to think about changing. Um, uh, we just learned, um, my husband, Terry, who's sitting behind as one of my elders for this um, event, learned that our clothing industry is a big contributor to climate change, partly because a lot of the factories in China where our clothes are made are powered by coal power, coal power plants. Um, there's a lot that we don't understand about how our lifestyle contributes to climate change. But one thing that I've recently learned or I'm learning about or just exploring, which has surprised me, is to understand that we can cut our emissions to zero and we won't solve the problem. So even though it's important to figure out how are we going to um, cut our emissions, cut down on our energy usage, we also have to figure out what are we gonna to do to draw carbon out of the air and back into the, into the earth where it, where it belongs, where it has been before we released it. Um, and that's why I, I've learned about how much our industrial agriculture, raising both our food from plants and from animals contributes to climate change. It's been shocking to see and shocking to learn that our industrial agriculture actually releases tremendous amounts of carbon into the air because it takes all the roots out of the soil and fossil fuels are used as fertilizer. Anyway, if you're interested in that, it's called regenerative agriculture. It's, it, I mean, part of the process of our industrial agriculture is taking the animals off the farm, putting them in animal concentration camps to raise as meat, which takes the manure out of the equation, which is one of the reasons why so much fossil fuel fertilizer is used. Anyway, um, so I'm just going to show you these really humble little things I've been exploring, Terry and I have been exploring, just to learn more about what kinds of changes we might need to all make in order to really address the problem of climate change. So Lena, if you can um, show slides of our backyard. 
<laughs> All right, here we go. Growing food and composting in our backyard. So when, when you put your food scraps in the, in the trash, it goes into a landfill and it creates methane, which contributes to um, greenhouse gases. Um, so we compost our food scraps. It's a really humble operation. We probably don't do it very well. Here's a picture of one of our composters. We now have three composters. I'm not a very good gardener, but um, on the left, you'll see some tomatoes that grew from seedlings that friend Michael Wida gave us. Um, two years ago, um, I love butternut squash, I planted a few butternut squash plants. And then at a certain point in the summer, just decided to let them do whatever they wanted to do, which was take over our backyard. And what you see there is just a really small selection of the 74 butternut squash that we had in our backyard that, that year. It's just a tiny way of understanding sort of how to be in relationship to the earth. Part of climate change is that we spend so much money transporting our food from other parts of the world and that if we can learn how to grow our own food, if we can learn how to grow things in our yards besides just grass, then, then we're just taking a little baby step into understanding how our lives need to change. Um, if you can show the next slide. Um, I'm really inspired by some, some Quaker, young Quaker friends, um, Craig and Megan Jensen, who have a farm in um, New Hampshire, Sun Moon Farm, which is a vegetable CSA, um, in which, you know, as, as, a, as a family, as farmers, they are engaging in regenerative agriculture and also at the same time creating community. So living in community is one of the ways that we can live a more sustainable lifestyle. And that's something that they're trying to grow at the same time as they grow their farm. So Lena, that you can turn off the slides now. Um, thank you. <clears throat> so, that was just one example that the inner change um, that we make must be accompanied in some way by outer changes and that we need help to do both the inner changes and the outer changes, the inner healing of the disconnects and the outer transformation that's needed. Um, and we can support ourselves in that. Um, early friends taught, had this talked about the lambs war, which they understood was, you know, there are ways in which society is really not obedient to the way God created us to live um, and, and that we need to participate in a world that's like a spiritual war using uh, the, what they call the weapons of the land, that is peace, patience, um, using the weapon of their speaking truth rather than any outward weapons. Um, but they also understood that that war or that conflict is going on inside of us. Um, that anything we see out in the world that we hate, dislike, want to change is related to things inside ourselves that we need to understand and we also need to heal and change. Um, I believe that the ways that we repress things within ourselves and, and demand that others in, in, um, also repress them in themselves is very much connected to all the outward problems in the world. And that, um, even taking tons of outward steps, even lots of activism, even changing public policy is not enough to make the changes we need to make if we don't also change ourselves. If we don't also find a new story about our place, for instance, about our place in the web of creation, a new story about our place in, um, in spiritual realities about our connection to God. So one of the things that Quakers gave the world as their you know, initial gift was a new story about our relationship to God and also a new story about what Christianity was or it could be. Um, spiritual realities are vast and yet there's not much room in our culture that hasn't been um, now increasingly in more circles there are to talk about those spiritualities beyond sort of conventional um, theologies or the accepted theology of whichever church group or spiritual tradition you're in. But in order to understand who we are and what's going on, and we are called to explore a lot more. We are called to have the freedom to talk about our, our dreams, our spiritual perceptions, our intuitions, um, these things, um, 
these things that can teach us the way forward if we pay attention to them. And in order to pay attention to them, we need to sort of give each other approval that we haven't gotten enough of from society. We have to create safe places in which to share our spiritual perceptions. Um, I believe that we are a part of what God is, not just that we're connected to God, not just that we can hear God directly, but that fundamentally we are a part of what God is. Um, so uh, Lena, you can show the slide about, um, seeking, about early friends. Um, when I first came to Quakers, I was really seeing people said, oh, there was so much power at the beginning of Quakerism. And, and I wanted to know what was that spiritual power known by early friends and how did they open to that power? That's one of the reasons I, I took all these courses and, on, on the Quakers. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, my Quaker life became the center of my life. That's the reason why I went on a pilgrimage to the places that were important to early friends. And in the next slide, Lena, you'll see me, uh, it's the same picture as in this one, but it's, you'll see my blue sweatshirt um, as I climb Pendle Hill, seeking a vision, um, seeking guidance. And I did find some spiritual guidance um, on the top of Pendle Hill. Um, but what I would like to share right now is um, some guidance from early friends. Um, in the next slide. So here are two passages of scripture that were important to early friends. He has grant, granted to us his precious and very great promises that through these you may escape from the corruption that is in the world and become partakers of the divine nature. And early Quakers, some of them use that phrase, partakers of the divine nature. Of the divine nature, I am a partaker, um, one of them said in a little poem he wrote. Um, a passage that they quoted very, very frequently is those who are led by the spirit of God are the children of God. In their time, that was most often translated as the sons of God. And I was really pleased when I read in a court transcript that early Quaker William Dewsbury in court quoted that scripture and used inclusive language. He said, for those who are led by the spirit of God are the sons and daughters of God. Um, Next slide, please. Um, the next slide comes from a passage from the journal of George Fox in which he's describing this incredible vision he had being taken up through the flaming sword into the paradise of God. Um, the flaming, apparently when, when God cast Adam and Eve out of the garden of Eden, he placed an angel with a flaming sword so they couldn't enter back into the garden of Eden. But George Fox was taken past that place into the paradise of God. And he um, shared his vision and what was revealed to him, what God showed him in this vision. And at the end, they, there are these, um, this sentence that has really spoken to me. Great things did the Lord lead me unto, and wonderful depths were opened up unto me beyond what can by words be declared. But as people come into subjection to the spirit of God and grow up in the image and power of the almighty, they may receive the word of wisdom that opens all things and come to know the hidden unity in the eternal being. That last phrase has really spoken to me. It's spoken to me because of my own mystical experiences in which I experienced what I would, I would have, I used different words, but the, the hidden unity in the eternal being, the oneness of God in which we participate, um, which flows through us, the light of God, the, the uh, illumination, the wisdom of God, which flows through us, that flows through everything, that illuminates everything. Um, but as I prepare for this talk, it really can, and I struggled with this idea. Well, isn't it dangerous to think of ourselves as partakers of the divine nature? We've been taught over and over again that it is dangerous, that it's egotistical. And of course, if your ego is what's defining itself as um, divine, there's a huge problem. Um, but there are also huge dangers in not recognizing our 
innate divine nature and not recognizing our unity with God, our participation in that hidden unity in the divine being. Lena, could you put the slide back off? Um, because there's a, a phrase I'd like to point out. Um, so as I'm preparing for this talk and I'm, I'm struggling with what to say and I'm struggling with what to say about this, this um, radical thing about um, our divine nature, this phrase came into me, as people come into subjection to the spirit of God and grow up in the image and power of the almighty. So it's like, even though we are a part of what God is, it's important that we come with that we are subject ourselves to that spirit that we worship God and not just say well I'm a part of what God is so I'm divine so I'm God I don't think that's the truth it's the, the truth is that um, what we are is so infinitely small and even though we are a part of what God is and even though we do partake of the divine nature we can't come into the reality of that until we we worship the reality of the wholeness, which is what is really divine. The wholeness is what is divine. And as we subject ourselves, as we let ourselves be dissolved, as we subject ourselves to the rigors of the spiritual journey and the sacrifices of the spiritual journey, as well as the joys and the pleasures and the privileges, then we can grow up in the image and power of the Almighty. And then these things can be revealed to us. It's, it's that paradox that I read over and over again in the writing of early friends. It's like they being, being brought low at the same time that they're, that they're that the, it's like only when you brought really low in terms of your own self image that the power of God can work through you. And that's what we're called to do is to let the power of God and the will of God, the wholeness work through us. And, I, I do believe it's useful to understand that we are a part of the wholeness, but we are not, as long as we are ourselves, we are not the wholeness. We are separate from it. And um, anyway, this is an area of my own growth. Um, I'm not, I'm gonna leave it there. It's an er we, there are areas of our growth in all directions in which we struggle and which we need the help of each other. I am so grateful as I prepared for this talk to recognize how much help I have had over um, the 40 years since I first woke up to the fact that I was on a spiritual journey, how much help I've had from individuals, friends, teachers, companions, elders, um, people who loved me and people who hated me, all of whom have taught me and helped me to grow. And um, now you can turn off the slide, Lena. Um, <clears throat> I am so grateful for that. Some of them are here tonight. Many of you who are here tonight, who I know, have been a help to me. I've participated in the journey and I have participated in your journey. And this is something we are doing together and that can only be done together. Um, and the good news is that we do have incredible capacities to help each other grow in our spiritual capacities that we aren't using and that we've become disconnected from. I'm just amazed. And, and in this year of the pandemic, I have had the wonderful blessing of some spiritual friendships online that I've met with uh, on a weekly basis that have really helped me um, reconnect with parts of myself and parts of my journey in a way that, that has been um, just incredible. Um, and, and I must say that being locked up in a house with my husband, Terry, has been part of that. You know, that we, we, we have also been companions to each other more than we would have been if we hadn't been uh, forced to live inside so much. Um, and it, it really has been an opportunity to explore, to express. Part of our, our culture teaches us to shut down often in almost invisible or unspoken ways with this disapproval that comes over our face about certain topics are not permitted, um, they're not approved of. And the opposite kind of um, reflection can be such a gift. It's like, oh, that little thing you're talking about that might seem insignificant, but it's a movement of the spirit in you, that's important. I value that, I wanna hear about that. And a face and a person that has that attitude or that heart or that presence can be such a gift to us and can help us blossom and bloom in ways that are um, remarkable. And that's what we need to do. We need to blossom and bloom. We need to 
grow into that fullness of the um, power of God that is in us, that wants to be in us, that wants to shine in us, that wants to act in us and through us and help us find the right place in the web of life so that we can thrive and our children can thrive on this beautiful planet. And I'm gonna take um, a, some time for a guided meditation after which you will be put into trios in which you get to share your experience from this meditation. Um, and maybe that we can see the slide about that. Um, Lena, the um, guidelines for small groups slide. I, I think I probably skipped another slide or two. Um, So after the meditation, you'll be put into groups of three and you'll basically have this question, how or when do you experience greater connection between head and heart or with the earth or with one another or with spirit? It's like any of these areas, uh, any of these disconnects, when do you experience greater connection? Um, what enables you to, to um, do some healing, um, some connecting, some um, living? And then each of you will have four minutes to share whatever you want to in relation to that question. It might be from your experience in the meditation or it might be from some other experience. And then after each person has had four minutes to share and each person is encouraged to use the spiritual language that's authentic for you, even if it's not language that is comfortable to mem members of your monthly meeting or to some other group or to your family, Use the language that's authentic for you and everybody will, is invited to just receive it lovingly without comment or interpretation or question. Lena will put prompts saying, okay, it's time for the next person to share. And then after each person has had four minutes to share, then I invite you to turn your attention to what you have created together or how the energy or how the sense of presence might have shifted in your small group, in your intimate group, in this intimate sharing. And each person has one minute just to share very simply something like what I'm sensing right now is, and it might be what I'm sensing right now is a feeling of warmth, a feeling of being heard. What I'm sensing right now is that we're all feeling a little more relaxed. Or what I'm sensing right now is like something rising, like something hopeful happening, or whatever it is that you're sensing something briefly um, that you can say. Each person has only one minute just to say something. But the point is to notice that when you do this kind of sharing, something shifts, some presence shifts. In a way, this is similar to what a, a clerk does when they're ser searching to sense the sense of a meeting, when a meeting's making a decision. It's paying attention to how the spirit is present, how the presence is present. Um, there's no right or wrong answer, just share what um, feels right to you. So um, I'm going to move into the meditation. And maybe after a minute, we can um, leave off those guidelines for the small group sharing. So this time I do invite you to take some deep breaths. You've just listened to me talk for a long time and now you can turn your attention back within yourself. Take a deep breath, pay attention to your breath as it comes in and slowly goes out. Settle in to your body, to the life in your body. It's very present, very alive, part of creation. And I invite you to remember or imagine a place in nature where you have felt connected or felt part of the wholeness or have felt really alive. It might be a garden, it might be uh, the beach with the wild pounding waves. It might be a mountain with an incredible view. It might be the woods. Use all your senses to remember that place or to imagine that place. What does it look like? What are the colors? Who's there? What are the creatures or the plants or the rocks? What 
What are you hearing? What are the sounds? Are there any smells or tastes or other sensations? Allow yourself to remember or imagine the feeling of belonging in this place, being a part of the natural world in this place. What does your body feel as you imagine being this, being in this wonderful, natural, alive place? Is there any wisdom that's available to you here? What is your sense of connection to God or spirit or the wholeness of life, the sacred wholeness in which you partake? The divine life, what is your connection to that? Before we end this meditation, I invite you just to offer gratitude, thanksgiving, or praise for whatever, whatever goodness you have experienced here, for whatever goodness you recognize is in the world, in you, in your connection to others. Take another deep breath, exhale deeply, and you'll be whisked off into your small group for sharing. For friends who are joining us via YouTube, I encourage you to take some time with these queries as well. Maybe you're alone. Maybe there's someone. Ask me questions. <laughs> 
or make a very brief comment. Uh -huh. And the way we do these, if folks could type your questions into the chat, um, those questions will come to me and Francisco and we will moderate them just in the spirit of honoring time. It allows us to combine similar questions and direct them to Marcel. So please uh, put your questions in the chat. Well, here's one. You, when you feel a sense of disconnection from God, what has brought you back to a new sense of connection, Marcel? Mm, that's a great question. And I think there are so many different ways that I find to come back because I get disconnected a lot. Um, but I actually, for me, it's just like quieting down and being present, being present in the present moment. And that's why I invited people just to pay attention to your breathing is one way to do it. Um, paying attention to how your body is feeling, paying attention to the sounds or just um, that's one way that helps me um, calm down. It doesn't necessarily help me get connected, but it, it's a step into that process. Um, I find that I, I, when I notice that I'm operating out of fear, worry, anxiety, um, anger, whatever, it's when I notice it, then I, then I realize I have a choice and I can turn my attention. I can remember, I can be grateful for, for um, the goodness I have experienced for the times and the moments when I felt God's presence. And just being grateful is one of the ways that I come back. Sometimes it's in reading, sometimes it's in conversation. Um, conversations with another person in which, which I get to share my heart and they share theirs is a really powerful way to get in touch with um, the presence of the spirit. Um, but there are an infinite number of ways. Going out in nature is often a, a really um, wonderful way to help that process too. Thank you. Another question here. You spoke about early friends. What was your sense about the ways they felt disconnected and what helped them to connect when they were disconnected? That was one of the things that was remarkable is that they, the people who became the first friends felt very disconnected from God. Um, they, they were living in England, which was very Calvinist at the time, and had a belief that actually God and Jesus were in heaven, separate from earth. They were actually literally separated from God. They felt separate. They spoke about this longing to um, feel like God owned them. And, and the word own means like claim them, because they also lived in a time in which people, most people believed in predestination, that God had decided before you were born whether you were going to go to heaven or hell after your life. And there was nothing you could do about it, except try to figure out which group you were in. And so they wanted to know that they were owned by God. They wanted to know that God was wanted them, <laughs> that God wanted to be with them, you know, after life. So they, they, they did feel indeed very disconnected. Um, and they, it was the gathered meeting, I think, that gave them the felt sense of the presence of God in them and among them and hearing hearing the voices of people speaking, you know, in the spirit out of the gathering meeting was a big help to them also. Um, they spoke about how being Quakers was, um, caused them a lot of persecution in their lives, or at least a lot of mockery. And they felt deeply bonded in worship to one another in this powerful love that helped them feel connected to God. Thank you. This next question feels like it relates to a piece of what you were just speaking to, Marcel. Um, this, the, this questioner says that yesterday, a friend noticed Easter and they stood and gave a message that they'd experienced resurrection in meeting for worship. What is your experience of resurrection or how spirit might be expectant 
uh, on our resurrections. Not quite sure what they might mean by that last point, but I'll just let that stand. Wow, that's a big and important question. Um, um, I'm just smiling because I'm thinking of how much resonance it has for me in my life, and yet I, I don't have a quick answer. Um, Resurrection is something that we can experience um, on a daily basis, but it's also something we are called to as a people. In, in our time, it's like we're, we're living in a time where things we're beginning to see that things are falling apart. It's like, how do we live so that we can, we can see what's um, being resurrected, what's being made new, what's, what God is filling with life? Um, so that you can experience resurrection on all, all different levels. Um, I've experienced resurrection in my own life, the times when I've been ill or in doubt or fear. Um, and then I, then um, usually with the help of, uh, of love and um, companionship, I, um, I find my way back to a sense of connection, connection to God, especially. And, and then I feel resurrected. I feel energy. I feel purpose. I feel meaning. I feel um, something. I remember that I have been guided and that, that I have been loved and that I've been held up through my life. And um, that sort of coming back into the state in which I remember that and feel that is a resurrection. And in a sense, it's always the reality. It's just sometimes I get disconnected from that awareness. Thank you. As you're speaking, Marcel, the questions are flying in. And I just have to say, friends, I so appreciate um, your spirit. And I'm afraid we will not get to all of these tonight. Um, here, another one here is, you know, many people have felt disconnected from our government or that it is worldly. Does Quaker wisdom call us to engage with our government or republic for the common good? How do you feel it instructs us? Hmm. Um, well, Quaker wisdom really asks us to see the truth about what's going on in our society and to recognize when people, institutions, uh, politicians, governments, um, professions are not acting in accordance with love and truth and God's ways um, and to speak truth about that. Um, but our Quaker tradition also calls us not to see anybody as an enemy, to see everybody as having um, the life of God in them in some way and um, capable of awakening to that in a bigger way um, and of meeting people in, with the hope of, of um, helping them to change and to find God's truth and God's love and God's justice and God's mercy. This questioner asks, Marcel, where or what is the joy for you now? Hmm. I find joy in spring. <laughs> I find joy in seeing things blossoming, blooming. I feel joy in seeing the light shining through new green leaves. I feel joy um, in, in my husband's love and care for me and in, in the connections I make with friends and in their love and care for me and, and family members. Um, I feel joy when I see others being loving to each other. I feel joy when I recognize the immense creative um, potentials that we have. I feel joy when I really can say, yeah, my life has been guided and I know that God is guiding all of us and that um, life is beautiful. Thank you for that. Have there been times when you felt disconnected from a particular group and then led to leave for another. As a spiritual nomad, what helps you to know when it's time to stay and work through the disconnect and when it's truly time to go? Oh, that's a really good question for discernment. Um, I don't, among Quakers, I don't think I've ever left a meeting because I felt disconnected from the meeting. It was more because 
um, I found housing that was far away and I wanted a place that a community that was closer that I could get to more accessibly or, uh, you know, I moved to a different state um, and it wasn't possible. So, um, but there have been times, um, particularly I had been at um, one meeting for a long time and I was traveling a great distance every Sunday to go back to that meeting because I love the community so much. So for me, it wasn't so much, there's no life left in this community, but, um, but my life, you know, finds life in, in a community that I can walk to on Sunday morning. And that, that seems, that seems more life giving to me now. And I have, to, I have to make the change. And sometimes making these changes is really hard when you, when you love a community, but I, I, I'm not thinking of an example right now, maybe because it's not good to give an example, but I also have wrestled with the times of saying, is there still life in this community or in this relationship or in this um, school or whatever it is? is? Is there still life in it for me or is it time for me to move on? That's, that's a live and important question. Thank you so much, Marcel. Um, I'd like to give you maybe just a moment in our final minute, if you have closing thoughts or things rising um, to offer to us gathered here before we end tonight. Well, if there's one story in my outline that I didn't have time to get to that I wanted to tell you. Um, and so I will tell you, it's um, the, the title of this story in my mind is Take Your Best Shot. Um, you know, I think when we look at climate change and many of the other problems that we're facing in the world, it seems like this problem is too big. How are we going to solve it? But I think climate change especially feels like that. This problem is too big. How are we going to solve it? And yet there's a part of me that says we have to take our best shot. We have to do the best we can. We have to live in the hope of that resurrection. Um, we have to live in the hope that God has things to reveal, that the spirit has things to reveal, that life has things to reveal that are possible. Um, and, and the story that I want to tell is a story of um, when I was on student council in my senior year of high school, we came up with the, we thought it was a brilliant idea of having a um, student, uh, having all the students in, in my high school, like a 1,500 students come together in the auditorium to watch the uh, student council play basketball against the faculty. <laughs> and none of us were good basketball players. None of us were talented at that at all. And I was especially awkward. I had never, never done very well in basketball in high school. Um, I'd never even tried, you know, it's like when the ball actually landed in my hands, usually by accident, because I never tried to catch it, I would just toss it away. So, uh, you know, that was the plan. It was like, make make people laugh. This is why we're doing it. We're, we're here to make everyone laugh. So I'm wearing silly clothes. I've got ribbons in my hair. The student council is losing zero to one after this 10, at the end of this 10 minute game, there's like 30 seconds left or 20 seconds left. I'm like a third of the third of the court away from the basketball and the basketball comes into my hands and maybe there's only three seconds left. I don't know. And my first impulse is to just throw it on the ground. You know, and I thought, but the whole school is watching me. I at least have to take my best shot. I have to do the best I can. I have to focus on that little hoop that's so far away. I have to throw with all the strength I have. And in front of the whole school, I made a basket. <laughs> so I, things that, you know, let's not just throw the ball away in terms of facing climate change. Um, let's take our best shot. Let's do the best we can and see what happens and see if, you know, things we don't think are possible become possible. Thank you so much, Marcel. And thank you all for staying two minutes over with us tonight. We do have to close. But thank you so much for being with us. Mm. Thank you, friends. Pleasure to be with you. Thanks so much for showing up. And those lingering on, just another reminder to join us June 7th for our next first Monday lecture. Oh, Francisco, we can see your screen. 
Thank you. And that June first Monday lecture is with Wendy Cooler, Better Than Good, Seven Testimonies for Quaker Caregiving. Uh, and what's on the screen right now is uh, the lecture series that has been continuing through April and May, uh, Jesus, History, Theology, and Evolution with John Dominic Crossan. Um, there are still uh, spots available in some of those lectures. And uh, here, of course, is Marcel's weekend workshop that you can join May 21st to 23rd, Going Deeper Together, and also in May, uh, our Kairos program with Francisco with the spiritual journey via Zoom. Thank you for being with us tonight. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lena. <laughs> All right, friends, we will have to close this call for now. Good night. <laughs>